So we're going to talk about um, Wisconsin's Code of Ethics for Local Election Officials. Um, and of course, I messed up my uh, PowerPoint here. Let's first talk about the Government Accountability Board. Um, this is a new agency. It's a combination of the State Ethics Board and the State Elections Board. And it was created um, as the very first act of the legislature in its 2007-2008 uh, um, session. It has six members, and by law they're required to be former judges. Um, we are unique in the country in that the people overseeing elections and ethics are required by law to be nonpartisan uh, individuals. The staff for both of the prior agencies was always required to be nonpartisan. Uh, but these board members serve a six-year term of office, and it requires four votes for them to take any action. Uh, they get a lot of attention in the last couple of years because of recall elections, um, but they oversee campaign finance, uh, ethics, conflict of interest laws for state public officials, uh, as well as the lobbying law. Um, the board is headed by a director and general counsel, that's me. Um, there are two divisions, the elections division and the ethics and accountability division. Um, the Ethics and Accountability Division has the areas that we're talking about tonight. Uh, we try to be a resource. I can tell you, having worked in this area since uh, April 1st of 1979, I know there's a lot of Wisconsin beyond Madison. Uh, um, I did grow up in Madison, uh, and my family, the family farm is on the other side of Lake Mendota on Kennedy Drive uh, in the town of Westport, although the village of Wanakee has taken up quite a bit of it. Um, but uh, I subscribe to the theory of former Governor Dreyfus that uh, Madison truly is 144 square miles surrounded by reality. And in fact, in Madison, they say it's not 144, it's really 77.1, um, which is typical of Madison. Um, I'm going to give you some examples of things to think about today. Uh, and hopefully what I say, you'll know the answers when we get to the end and there'll be a pop quiz. Um, one real life situation that will, that hopefully you'll get some information how to answer this question. A visiting delegation gives gifts to city council members. How do we deal with that? A second, village board's member spouse is an employee of the village and a member of the union. Questions that might come up as a result of that. A business offers to send the zoning board members to view its operations in Illinois. That actually might be punishment. Um, a village board member has a contract with the wind farm company, and that wind farm company is seeking a zoning change or something from the municipality. A um, couple more. The city treasurer wants to hire uh, his or her niece as a summer employee. A city council member wants to plow snow for the city. A village board wants to host an appreciation dinner for its village employees. And a zoning petition to build a gas station next door to a city council member's house comes before city council. You all know the answers to all those questions. I don't have to talk anymore. Uh, and then uh, Bucky Norman doesn't get any fees. So let's talk about who is covered by uh, the ethics code. Um, elected officials. Your mayor, city council, village board uh, are all uh, covered by Wisconsin's uh, Code of Ethics. A city or village manager, any appointees that serve at the pleasure of the executive or governing body are going to be covered by this code. Uh, appointees who serve for a specified term of office, if you have a uh, police chief who has a fixed term and then gets renewed, for example. Um, Civil service employees uh, are not covered by this. Um, generally, your line staff will not be covered. Um, let's talk about the big picture of uh, the code. What it's designed to do is to ensure that officials do not profit from holding public office. Uh, we want to help preserve the integrity of the governmental decision-making process. And we want to strengthen citizens' confidence in the integrity of government officials. That's why we have a code of ethics, is for these three reasons. 
common questions that come up, soliciting or accepting gifts, tickets, meals, other things. If you are a state pub uh, local public official covered by the code, do not accept items of more than insubstantial value. I hate that line, but um, if offered because of your official position. And that's one of the key things. It has to be offered to you because of what you're doing as a public official. And it has to be something significant. Um, you know, the dinner out there in this case is going to be fine, if, even if they had pens or nail files or whatever you use for your giveaways, those would be fine because they have no real value except for the name on them. Uh, do not use your position to solicit items for yourself, uh, your immediate family, or an organization with which you are associated. Your immediate family is going to be uh, your spouse, your dependent children, and if you have other dependent relatives such as parents or an extended family where you provide more than 50% of the support. An organization with which you are associated, you are on the board of directors of that association or you're an officer of that association. It's because you're a member doesn't necessarily make you a member of, or does not make you formally associated for this purpose. Don't solicit or accept an item if it could be reasonably expected to influence judgment or to be considered a reward for official action. This is what we call the smell test. Uh, really, um, sometimes you have to step back or you need to have a reality check when someone offers you something uh, because you don't think twice about it, but you have to step back and say, what would a reasonable person think when someone is offering me something? Were they trying to influence me? Were they giving it to me because of my public position? Uh, or were they trying to influence my judgment? Uh, a lot of public officials go, I can't be bought for a $50 trinket. Or a, uh, but sometimes you have to look at what is the perception of this when we're talking about these issues. There are exceptions to taking things in your public position. If the item is given to you, um, and it's accepted on behalf of the municipality, and it's primarily for the benefit of the municipality. Um, think about that first uh, uh, example that was given for real life situations. Um, it's not unusual that as a public official, you'll be given something on behalf of the municipality. That should stay with the municipality. It shouldn't end up on your mantelpiece uh, as, as a result of that. Uh, Oftentimes, you are given something to benefit the municipality. Um, you know, they take you on a trip because it's going to benefit the municipality. Um, and we'll get into some more details on those kind of things. But that's really what you're looking at. Is this for me or is it for uh, the governmental entity that I represent? Items that are unrelated to your holding public office or position. I assume most of you have good friends who give you gifts on occasion, um, you give them gifts, uh, and has nothing to do with the fact that you serve uh, on uh, the governing body of those organizations. Uh, you get these things because you've been a good neighbor. You get these things because you've been a longtime friend. Uh, you get them because of some other affiliation that you have. Uh, that's going to be one of the exceptions. Um, sometimes you have to think these things through because it's hard to distinguish. Like the, I know people. My, I mentioned the town of Westport. My uncle, my dad's oldest brother, was the town chairman of the town of Westport for so long uh, that they now named the town hall after him. Uh, and he, his identity, for many people who knew the town of Westport, was inseparable uh, with that. Um, but as far as I know, he didn't have any issues. <laughs> You cannot act on matters in which you are financially interested. Um, in most cases, items that come before you in your governing body, you're going to be able to act on. The fact that it's changing the property tax levy, yes, you have a financial interest in this, but um, it, it applies to everybody. And you're not going to exempt yourself because of that. Um, if you have an action that substantially affects a matter in which uh, you or your immediate family or the organization is associated with has a substantial financial interest, 
that differs from the interest of a large group. That's why I use the property tax example. We elect you to set the tax levies. Uh, we elect you to make noise ordinance uh, decisions. Um, there's a number of things, but we don't elect you uh, to extend the road past your new business that you were just opening up. Uh, that's a good example of where you probably would not want to be acting uh, if uh, that's coming before the council. Here are some general provisions that you're going to find in the Code of Ethics. Government resources may only be used for a public purpose. Anybody remember what they called the caucus scandal back in 2000? Uh, down in Madison, we had uh, employees of the state legislature who were using the legislative resources uh, to design campaign brochures, uh, to set up fundraisers, uh, basically using government resources to run campaigns. Not unusual to see something similar uh, at the local level, it's just that it's not as visible sometimes. Uh, government resources should only be used for government purposes, not for something personal. Um, pay to play is prohibited. This basically means you cannot accept a campaign contribution in exchange for taking official action. Uh, normally you can't accept a, you know, a gift of something because that's what we were talking about before because of your official position. But because the Code of Ethics defines a campaign contribution as an exception to the gift, we have to have this provision that says um, we're not going to give you a campaign contribution with the expectation or in recognition of action that you took uh, on this. Usually we have to have a very direct link between that uh, campaign contribution. But when they talk about pay to play, that's what we're talking about, is um, someone rewarding you uh, for action that you're taking uh, in the form of a campaign contribution. We already talked about the fact you shouldn't get rewarded uh, through gifts uh, or other things of value. 9.4612 of the Wisconsin statutes is the misconduct in public office. If you are intentionally violating the code of ethics, this is where you're going to see the charges. Uh, when we were talking, when I talked about the caucus scandal back in uh, the early 2000s, this is what people got the uh, legislative leadership ended up getting charged with was misconduct in public office for directing their staff uh, to run campaigns out of their offices. Um, there's a, also a provision that says that you may not um, contract with the government entity that you are uh, an employee or an officer of for more than $15,000. Um, and that's what 946.13 uh, provides. It sets a specific limit on this. Um, there are also a number of court cases dealing with uh, compatibility of offices. Basic rule here is uh, you can't be the boss and employee at the same time. Uh, the Attorney General's office is the go-to office for getting opinions on whether or not two separate offices uh, could or could not be compatible. There's a whole range of those decisions. We often get these questions um, and your counsel, there's a nice index in the opinions of the Attorney General that uh, directs you to which offices may or may not be compatible. We have a number of legislators who serve on county boards, for example, not incompatible. Um, but you're going to find uh, situations where um, in smaller municipalities, one person wears several different hats. And we have to make sure that in their hat on the governing body, they're not also um, setting the policy and directing the hat that they're going to be wearing uh, in some other position. These are things that you should know. This is the shorthand version. I gave you the big picture of why we do this. This is the shorthand version uh, of this. And if you see the food and beverages, you get an idea. Don't accept items or surfaces offered to you because of your position. You know, gee, we really like the job you're doing as town chair. You know, here's a ticket to the Twins game. I figure it's closer than the Brewers. They actually have a worse record than the Brewers. Don't participate in decisions which affect you financially. 
if the zoning change is going to have a direct impact on your business and your business is unique or there's only a handful of those businesses, you can't say that it's part of a much broader group, don't participate in that decision making. Again, these are all common sense things, but oftentimes they get lost uh, in the, you're looking at, you're, you're, very, you, you're in these positions because you care about your community. And sometimes you're so focused on the community you forget, hey, I've got an interest in this. But believe me, there's plenty of people in that community who recognize that decision uh, could impact you directly. Uh, and most of you think, I can separate myself from this. We try to draw the line so you don't have to think about it. Uh, on this, when in doubt, uh, this is what you want to talk to your uh, um, municipal attorney about. Who enforces these at the local level? Uh, this is enforced by the district attorney. If the district attorney has a conflict, the attorney general is going to step in. There are civil penalties for violating these laws, like a traffic ticket, uh, up to a $1,000 forfeiture. Um, most likely, that's the kind of penalty. If any is going to be assessed, it's going to be a civil forfeiture. Um, there are for intentional violations, and we have had cases both at the local level and the state level where people have intentionally violated uh, these provisions uh, where you can be fined up to $5,000 in prison for one year. A lot of times, because the penalties are higher, you'll see the charge uh, for misconduct in public office statute that I uh, provided earlier. Our office provides opinions to state public officials that are confidential. Um, and on our website, you can uh, access those, they've been redacted without the people's names, and they provide a good set of guidance for dealing with things like accepting tickets to sporting events, um, when you can vote on a particular subject or not. Um, we try to make sure that, you know, by placing these up on the website, it's a good resource for your municipal attorneys, it's a good resource for you if you don't want to uh, incur the, mo the money to talk to your municipal, municipal attorney. Um, our goal is to make sure that they're consistent uh, and that they're out quickly. As a local election official, you can't call us and say, I've got a question. Chances are you can and we will answer it, but we're gonna say, really, you need to talk to the municipality, uh, the municipal attorney. A lot of public officials are a little reluctant because it costs them money to talk to their municipal attorney, but that's their job to do that Sometimes the local officials don't like the answer they got from the municipal attorney. On occasion, we don't like the answer the municipal attorney gave. Um, so you can imagine the delicate situations that come up on this. And just in the last month, we've had uh, local issues where uh, all of a sudden the city administrator is calling us up and saying, our city attorney says we can do this, but it doesn't seem right to me. Well, it turns out that's really not what the city attorney said when we and we try to be very careful not to step on their toes, but we try to have a, a good collegial relationship. Our job, since we do this every day, is to really be a resource, but we're gonna be a resource primarily for your municipal attorney, not for you individually, because there are 6,000 elected local election officials in this state, and I only have six people working in that division, um, and they actually do campaign finance and lobbying as well. And the 2,500 state public officials that we give advice to takes up enough of our time without adding all of the locals uh, to that. Now, if the legislature uh, required us to do that, we of course would, and as I said, if you call us, we're not gonna hang up on you. We're going to uh, point you to some things on our website, encourage you to talk to your municipal attorney. We had another situation um, where um, the municipal attorney gave advice to a police and fire commission, the police chief and three members of the commission all contacted us looking uh, to see if that was the right advice because they were the ones that were affected uh, by that advice. Um, it's not in this part of the state though. Let's go back to some real life situations and I'm gonna put the pressure on you because I don't, I figured if I drove 200 
50 miles almost to get up here. You can tell me a few things uh, on this. And um, I can't guarantee that all the answers will be answers that you would like. So let's take the visiting delegation gives gifts to city council members. Anybody want to tell me what, what the parameters are in accepting gifts from a visiting delegation, whether it's a delegation from uh, a foreign country or a delegation from, well, Minnesota is a foreign country. Um, at least the Vikings are. Um, what? Uh -huh. Well, um, that that's a good question. Um, but they're offering you some. They're a delegation. They're there to learn from you. Um, they're there to tell you about their business, and they're offering you gifts. What parameters do you think should be involved in this? I mean, we get people from other countries coming in to learn about Wisconsin's elections or campaign finance. They all wanted to hear about the recalls, um, and they will offer something. Usually it's a very small token, so it's no big deal, but I've been offered a very nice tablecloth, uh, and there have been other types of gifts. Um, any other thoughts about accepting gifts from visiting delegations? Basically, the gifts must remain with the city uh, when they're given. Uh, we have a number of things on display in our office that have come, uh, they, and sometimes they're pretty inconsequential. They're nice pictures of uh, part, um, you know, but things like, you know, hats or T-shirts really don't have any value, um, particularly after you've worn them for much time. Or like today, the hat, if you were wearing it from the car to here, uh, loses its value very quickly. But generally, you know, books, uh, one of the big things you get is a nice pictorial book, a coffee table-like book that tells you all about the splendors of Norway. You know what? That stays with the city. It doesn't end up on your coffee table uh, on that. Um, it is something that the city can then use. Um, one practice that we do think, if you accumulate a lot of things and the city doesn't want to hold on to them, you know, we have various fundraisers that go on for the city, uh, like for the uh, combined campaign for the United Way or whatever it's called uh, in various areas. You could auction that off, uh, and then maybe you'd buy it at that point. Um, my division administrator says, well, I tell people they can buy the gift from the city. I said, really, do we really want to set up that kind of thing of setting the value? But, you know, if the city, uh, like with the library, uh, sells its books, you put it in with that, it gets sold, just, and then you pay for it, I don't see an issue with that. Um, but again, as a representative of the city, that should be your guiding principle. If they're offering you something, it's for that reason, unless it's very insubstantial. Little, um, you know, lapel pin, uh, hats, T-shirts are good examples of things that um, really accepting those are not going to be a problem. There are eight of these, by the way, and so far you guys are one for one, and that's good. So... Um, a village board member's spouse is an employee of the village and a member of the union. What can the village board member do with respect to the union contracts, if we have union contracts anymore? Um, why am I talking? You guys know it all. Um, that's right. Basically, um, if a uh, governing body board member uh, has a spouse or uh, immediate family member who is going to benefit from the labor negotiations. They cannot participate in the negotiations, cannot um, participate in the deliberations when the council uh, discusses it, and cannot vote on it. Similarly, if the budget is passed before uh, everything is set and the budget sets the parameters that are going to be dealing with um, you know, we're going to give a 2% raise to all of our unionized employees or the people that we're negotiating with. If there hasn't been a contract signed, they should be, stay out of that part of it, uh, just like they would as if they were negotiating. Um, 
a lot of this has to do with the appearance. And again, you are all in municipalities where um, they know you not only as an elected official, but they know you personally. And these are the kind of questions your friends and neighbors, even though you don't think your friends, are, they all trust you. Um, but they are going to be thinking that, they're going to be asking that, and that's why we have this guidance. A business offers to send the zoning board members to view its operations in Illinois. Is this okay? I, I, of course, the second one is not as likely, although Chicago has got its attractions, and Galena does. Um, and if Wisconsin happens to be beating, playing Illinois in a sporting event down in Champaign, Yes. It, yeah. The general answer is this is okay. So you've got it right. I saw people nodding their heads, people who don't want to speak up. I saw a number of people nodding their heads. It is okay. The kind of things to take into consideration are uh, to avoid it being a junket. You know, a lot of you have travel schedules. You know, when your employees travel within the state or even outside of the state, this is how much they can get reimbursed for lunch, dinner, hotel. Uh, they don't get reimbursed for alcohol. So what you're here, that's a good set of guidance, I think, is reasonable expenses uh, for travel uh, on this. You know, they could charter, you know, uh, a bus to take you down there. Um, they probably could fly you down there, but, you know, these are the balanced things that you want to look at. Uh, the corporate jet, I think, with the open liquor cabinet, no. These are the kind of things that you want to look at. But this is your job, uh, you know, to see this business and growing business in your community is a very important thing. Um, you have to look at it from, um, am I getting a lavish dinner out of this or am I getting the same kind of dinner I'd get if I went out uh, after my council meeting and was paying for it myself? Um, or if I'm traveling on behalf of the municipality, what am I going to get reimbursed for on this? And I think, you know, alcohol is a good example of things. Um, but now, bear in mind, if you're going to Chicago, the travel schedule isn't going to compensate you for what it costs to get a nice steak in Chicago. Um, but the scotch that goes with that steak, pay for it out of your own pocket. Make sure they don't do that. Um, any questions about this? Anybody get offered to go to Illinois, Michigan? No. The village board member has a contract with a wind farm company. The wind farm company wants uh, something from the village. Um, this is not an unusual practice. These companies will, before they seek it, go out, find local officials and offer them uh, a contract to put up a turbine on their land. Um, what's 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 your role here? Is, um, that's right. You cannot participate in this. You have a clear conflict here. Um, cannot do it. Um, even if it's the the deciding vote, you can't be part of that. If it's going to fail because you don't have enough votes on that, I think most people uh, have a feel for that situation. It's not an uncommon one that uh, pops up in. Uh, not only Wisconsin, but throughout the country as we look at alternative energy sources. <laughs> Last four. City treasurer wants to hire the niece as a summer employee. Now, you can't answer because um, I know that you want the apple, but it's out in the car. And so, you, so I want someone else to comment on this. Anybody? Can city treasurer... Uh, hire their niece as a summer employee. Um, if there's a specific rule in your spouse, what the ethics code says is your immediate family. Your niece is not your immediate family because they're not your child, they're not your spouse, unless you're providing more than 50% of the support for that niece. That's your rule. Does it look good? I will tell you, um, take away city and put state we had a state treasurer, not the current one, um, ask us this advice. We said, well, the law doesn't prohibit it, but we don't think you should do it. It doesn't look good. Did it anyway. There's a reason why that person is no longer the state treasurer. 
it was a campaign issue in the campaign uh, on it. Uh, some things that are not illegal in the, per in the perception of the people you represent are still wrong. Now, I know there are municipalities in this area uh, where everybody is related to everybody, and that makes it hard. Um, and let me digress for a moment. Um, I just, my favorite example of this, where everybody's related to everybody, is we had uh, in a, a northern municipality a town board chair who was subject to recall. And the recall was very close and went to a recount. And so the town clerk, uh, because uh, she operated out of her house, said, I'm going to take these ballots and secure them, and I don't have an office, so I'll take them and put them in my safe at home. One problem. She was married to the town chair, and I don't know how you get away from that, but that's not an unusual example. I think about that often when we talk about these kind of connections. City council member wants to plow snow for the city. This is a contract. This is not as an employee. The answer is you can do that if the contract is less than $15,000 for this. Um, again, are there other people that can do this? Um, some places, uh, this, is, this is just the way it works. There's only a handful of people who plow uh, in the area, and they all happen to have positions with, with the government. 15,000 is the, is the catch-all for this. The city is better off not doing it. Most of you as public officials recognize the appearance, even if it's not prohibited by law. Village board wants to host an appreciation dinner for village employees. Any reason why they can't do that? They really can. It's, it's really part of compensation. They can do that. Um, again, we're expecting that it's going to be a reasonable decision uh, to do this. They're not going to uh, hold the appreciation dinner um, in Hawaii. Um, when we were talking about this in the office, when these, and this, this does come up, it was like, well, can the public officials, uh, can the employees hold one for the public officials? And your first... Our first thought is, well, no, because they're getting something because they're a public official. But on the other hand, you have to look at some practicalities. The mayor has uh, a personal assistant who serves at his pleasure. They've worked together for years. Does that mean she can't give him a Christmas present, uh, a birthday uh, gift? No. There are some, again, common sense applications to this. Um, but... Uh, you know, should, should that a public official be receiving gifts from their employees? Um, generally, no. Um, you can think of situations where that's how they're trying to curry favor and keep their jobs, maybe. Um, last example. A zoning petition to build a gas station next door to a city council member's house comes before city council. What can that council member do? Are they gaining something because there's a, a gas station there? Maybe they're losing something because there's a gas station there. You know, a lot of these things are very fact dependent. Um, you have to evaluate it in that context. Um, but, you know, there are some pluses to this. Either way, um, it's going to have a direct impact on the, their financial interests, whether it's decreasing their property value. Uh, increasing it, I can think of all kinds of examples where it would be cut either way. Don't participate in this situation. If it means nothing happens because we end up with a tie vote, that's the way it is. Um, these are really just good at, um, applications, helps you think about the general principles I've been talking about. Does anybody have any questions about the examples? Yes. Tom. Uh, 
Um, generally, they can't participate in the setting of the person's salary, but they can otherwise participate uh, serving on the on the board. Uh, they may choose to pass an ordinance prohibiting something like that, but under the code of ethics, uh, the test is really going to be, um, you know, what, what's their role in terms of the f substantial financial interest. I guess setting my salary is a pretty important thing. You should stay out of that uh, issue. We have a municipality um, just outside of Madison, city of Verona, uh, which has a population of about 10, 11,000. And it has the headquarters of Epic, which is a large medical records company. Epic is expanding to the point where they're going to have 10,000 employees uh, working on that campus. Can you imagine the impact that this company has on uh, the city of Verona and its decisions? Two of the council members uh, already on an eight-member council one is an employee of Epic, the other has a spouse. Is But should you, I could see a situation where there are six uh, members of that eight-member council who have some connection to Epic as it continues to grow. And these are the kind of situations that they have to wrestle with. Um, I talked about this a little bit, where to go to get more information. This is our website. We have our redacted opinions that we've given to state public officials or to municipal attorneys. Um, it doesn't have the individual's names on it. In most cases, you'll never figure out who we are giving advice to, but you'll often find very similar situations that you're encountering there. Um, we also have what we call guidelines, um, which is really taking the basic principles and applying it to a situation. Um, one of the things we run into a lot um, with our state public officials are, can they go to political conventions? Uh, what are the rules on that? Well, you can't be using state resources to go to a political convention. Um, you can't be accepting gifts uh, to go to that, but you do have a campaign fund, which you can. So we synthesize some of those guidelines uh, for our state public officials on what sources of money they could use to participate because we do have a number of our elected officials who um, are in the legislature or in statewide office who are going to play a role at the national level and so the question is how are they going to uh, fund their participation in that when they can't accept a gift um, they certainly can't use state resources so we try to make sure that they have good guidance on that same thing is true with sporting events when you can accept uh, those kind of gifts. Um, I want to go back to one, the, the example we talked about of travel to Illinois. One piece of advice that we give um, governing bodies is if you're going to take a trip, have the governing body go on record authorizing it. Um, you know, pass a resolution saying we're sending a delegation of two Illinois for this purpose, we're going to accept it. That gets it out there in the open, um, makes a good record that it was something that was considered, uh, the parameters that you put on it are there. That, I think that's really uh, a good way to approach that. Um, it'll also give you a good, should we be going, uh, sense from a political judgment standpoint, uh, because um, you know what you do, people are paying attention to. Sure. I'll start in the back. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure it's a very clear answer, but my sense is I would not advise a town board to be using government money to pay for a holiday party. Um, for the employees, maybe. Again, if it's simple. Uh, for themselves, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I, I report to a citizen board um, when we have holiday gatherings it's out of our pockets, uh, you know, even though I'm, my biggest concern when I have it with my board, if I go out to dinner with my board members is, we're not talking business, okay? As a lawyer with six judges, it's usually not a problem. We got plenty we can talk about <laughs> uh, on that, but 
Uh, that's actually one of the one of the reasons why I want to go out to dinner with my board members is to make sure that they don't violate uh, the open meetings law uh, on that. And in fact, when we do do that, and every December we uh, we will all go out to dinner, spouses will join in, uh, staff will join in. That's part of our meeting notice that we're going to have a social gathering so people know. And that, and we specifically say there's no business. That way, if they see us at the restaurant in downtown Madison, we've taken, you know, we've I've made sure it's on the agenda and people know about it, and made that decision. Now, if they happen to overhear something and we didn't abide by it, you know, um, we'll sit down with the attorney general and talk about what the what the penalty is going to be as far as the forfeiture. But I think the example you raised, I would advise. Board members should not be going out together unless they're paying for it out of their pockets uh, for that. And obviously, you're going to have a lot at the end of the night talking about uh, open meetings and the smaller the municipalities. With this new board that I report to that are former judges, I mean, three of them were sat on the Court of Appeals. They were used to consulting with each other uh, about the opinions that they were writing. And I, one of the things I had to say is, you don't have that luxury anymore because if three people talk, uh, and it takes four people to vote, you've clearly violated the law because you can block any action of the three if you come to an agreement. When we set up subcommittees of the board to review my performance, for example, it's a two-member committee uh, to, to do those uh, meetings. You had a question up front? Um, that's, a, that's a good, the question is, what should be done with the gifts that come from the WMCA conference? Uh, and some of them are reasonable, you know, I mean, the Door County wine, is some, there's some nice wine. There's some nice wine in uh, Sauk City, Wisconsin. Um, it, you know, again, I think it's a question of judgment. My, I would normally say I'd give it back to, to the municipality, but I don't think it's going to be a big deal uh, if you take home, you know, a basket of wine and cheese. Uh, DVD players, you know, yes, they cost them. Hundred dollars, but they're really a dime a dozen when you think about them. I mean, no, actually, we don't use DVD players anymore. We use Blu-ray players, which also means you have to upgrade from. I still have a lot of nice video cassettes. Well, my kids growing up, I have all the Disney videos that uh, I have to figure out what to do with. Um, you know, but remember, it's your governing body that's paid to send you there. So I think the best practice is to say, is this something that the city can use? Is there a benefit that can come out of this? You know the holiday party. Let's donate this. Um, it's that that that's what I think is the best practice on this. You're going to see people going any number of ways because um, these are tend to you know tend to be donated by uh, sponsors for for uh, the municipal clerks association or for the Wisconsin Towns Association, whoever's holding uh, those things. Um, I've never won, so I've not had to wrestle with that uh, decision, but I thought about it, and you know, it was always well. We'll have to give it away. That's sort of where we developed the practice. We've had employees win, and we said, let's put it up for an auction and donate the proceeds to our partners in giving campaign. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can handle this. Question in the back. That's right. That's that's a very good point. Now, you can get advice on open meetings and um, public records issues from the Attorney General's office. You don't have to pay this great law firm for that advice, um, but you might get an answer quicker by talking to them. Um, but um, those of us in state government, we actually meet twice a year, all the attorneys for various agencies, uh, just on public records, public meetings issues, because it's a vast, it's a quickly changing area of the law, and it's one that you know, Wisconsin has always been very committed to a transparent government, uh, and we have so many levels of government. Sometimes that's the easiest thing. Um, early on, when I was started as the staff counsel for the elections board, I had to start calling district attorneys because I had uh, poll workers who, when the polls closed, ushered everybody out and locked the doors and counted the ballots. Now. Not only is that a governmental subunit when it comes to counting those votes, there's also a very specific statute that's supposed to be done publicly. Um, and I still occasionally have to 
uh, say, would you send a police officer and tell them unlock the doors uh, for something that you would think would be expected? Um, your municipal attorney is your best resource in this area. Um, they will provide you with the advisory opinions. I talked about our staff and some of our limitations. And I am done for, the, for this presentation, but I really am glad to be here and to answer the questions. I really appreciate being invited uh, uh, to come up, and I hope that this information provides you probably that I hope my primary hope is that it's just reinforcing the values that you're bringing to this. And my sense looking out over the audience is I didn't shock too many people with anything I said. Uh, they all said, yeah, of course, that's, oh yeah. Um, but when the situation confronts you sometimes, what is the right decision? Um, we have tremendous committed public officials in the state of Wisconsin um, I'm assuming this room represents them as well as the ones I've met uh, in my 30 plus years working uh, on elections and ethics and campaign finance. So thank you for your service and thank you for putting up with me for an hour of your time tonight.